That sounds very nice. <laughs> That's a good investment. The guest brought a guitar she purchased from a young kid in the 1960s for $85. The guest's intention was to play and record with his dad, who had a violin. The guitar had been in the guest's family for over 50 years and was identified as a 1960s Les Paul Jr., a well-built model that became popular among guitar players. The guitar was a relatively inexpensive model at the time, but it had its value increased over the years. The guest's grandson used the guitar in a band but the guest suggested him to buy a different guitar to preserve that Les Paul Jr.'s value. It was well kept and was still in good condition. The Les Paul Jr. had become a sought after model among guitar players and collectors, and it was valued at. $5,500 to $6,000. Oh, that sounds very nice. <laughs> That's a good investment. I'm really surprised. <laughs> Well, it's like winning the lottery, as you know. The guest inherited a painting from her grandmother, who gave it to her as a gift. She had always enjoyed the painting's details, but didn't know its origin. The artist was identified as Petrus van Schendel, a Belgian painter. Petrus van Schendel was a Dutch-Belgian genre painter in the Romantic style, who specialised in nighttime scenes, lit by lamps or candles. He studied at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Antwerp, from 1822 to 1828 and received a gold medal for perspective upon graduating. The painting was signed and dated 1847 and depicted a beautiful interior scene. This was a valuable and beautiful piece being appraised at. It could go as high as forty to fifty thousand dollars. It's you look surprised. <laughs> well, it's like winning the lottery, as you know. Really? For that one. I win that one. This collection would be a dream come true for anyone who wants to become a fairy tale princess. It is a tiara collection, containing some of the best and rarest tiaras ever collected. There is a silver tiara here, which is of Indian origin and contains cultured pearls as a symbol of royalty. There's another tiara, which is also of Indian origin, but the stones are not real. We also have one that resembles an 1890s tiara, but is from the 1930s. There is also an unusual hair comb tiara from the 1870s, which is probably the most special. Then, the rarest of them all is the one from 1860, during the Victorian era. This collection contains many beautiful tiaras, and at auction, these tiaras would sell for. Just for effect, maybe a hundred. This one, maybe a hundred dollars. I love this comb, I would say 150. But this one, five, six hundred dollars really? for that one. I wear that one a lot. In many cultures, portrait pottery vases like the one displayed are more than just decorative pieces. They often carry significant symbolic meanings. This particular vase was inherited by the guest from her father many years ago. My father gave it to him in 1970, and my mother didn't like it, so my father gave it to me, and I've enjoyed it ever since. It was made by the Owens Pottery Company in Zanesville, Ohio. Owens Pottery Company. Depicted on the surface of the vase is a monk holding what appears to be a bottle and a glass in his hands. On the other side of the vase, we can see the name of the artist who painted this piece, Arthur Williams. Williams was an American artist who collaborated with several pottery manufacturers, including Owens. But Williams is regarded as the best portrait painter in Zanesville, most lifelike, and, and very seldom will you see an Owens portrait done by Arthur Williams. Stamped underneath the vase was the maker's mark. There are, however, some minor manufacturing wares on this piece, which could slightly affect its value. Even with these minor flaws, this pottery portrait vase by Owens is estimated to be worth. Worth about $2,500 reasonably, so. This painting is a cherished family heirloom, passed down since the 1900s. The guest's husband inherited it from his parents, who were friends of the artist. It was done by an artist named Nordfeld, who was a friend of my father-in-law. And you inherited this? Yes. This oil painting on canvas was created by Braut Julius Olsson Nordfeldt. Braut Julius Olsson Nordfeldt. Born in Sweden, Nordfeldt was an American artist known for his paintings of seascapes and depictions of New Mexico's indigenous culture. Nordfeldt worked in diverse styles and media, including etchings and prints, portraits, still lives, and landscapes. 
This painting is actually two-sided, a practice typical of starving artists and indicative of an early period in his career. One side features a nude painting, while the other shows a much more modern style relative to 1900s painting. Previous side, when we were looking at the painting of the nudes, that he had been influenced by Cezanne. Mm -hmm. In this picture, you can see also the influence of Matisse in the colors he selected. Relating to a woodcut done by Nordfeld in 1916, this two-sided painting by such a renowned artist is worth at least. It sell for over $100,000 in a retail gallery. <laughs> surprising me. They're wonderful Very pieces. Surprise. The guest brought the artworks from her parents purchased in Paris in the late 1950s or early 1960s from a gallery called Eris Claire. The gallery was known for its avant-garde art and the artworks were made by the French artist Gaston Chissac. Chissac was an outsider artist who didn't fit into traditional artistic moulds and was influenced by prehistoric art, children's art and Picasso. Chisak's work had become popular due to its unique combination of influences and his value is increasing. The artworks were abstract and featured anthropomorphic shapes, making Chisak's style controversial among outsider art experts. The artworks were identified as a collage, an ink on paper and an oil on canvas, all executed in the 1950s and 1960s. The artwork brought together Arizona petroglyphs and high style French outsider art the appraiser's expert eye, scrutinizing each piece of art, valued them at twenty and forty thousand dollars. The oil on canvas between thirty and fifty thousand oh. dollars, and the drawing at between five and ten thousand dollars. You are you are surprising me. They're wonderful Very pieces. Surprise. Fantastic! Wow, that's a great surprise. Thank you. A 1910 googly-eyed doll surprises with its value, despite being on the wrong body. A guest brought in a doll that had been given to their aunt by her sisters when she was around four or five years old. The aunt, the youngest of eight siblings, would be nearly a hundred years old if she were alive today. The guest inherited the doll six years ago, after the aunt, who never married or had children, passed away. This doll, never appraised before, was identified by the appraiser as a googly-eyed doll, made around 1910 by the German maker Hertel & Schwab. These dolls are distinctive with their impish look, oversized, side-glancing eyes. They're sort of impish looking. If you notice that she has a watermelon mouth, and normally she would have side-glancing eyes, they're a little bit oversized. And watermelon-shaped mouths. The doll has a bisque head and a composition body but the appraiser noted that it had been redressed with synthetic material instead of the original natural silk, and the shoes were new. Although joint, the doll is not made on the correct body, which would be about six inches shorter. Yeah, she's got a bisque head, and normally she would be on a jointed body like this, but she would probably be about six inches shorter. The numbers 163 and 12 at the neck base indicate its original specifications. On the correct body, the doll would be highly valuable at auction. However, even with the incorrect body, it still holds significant worth, much to the guest's pleasant surprise. While examining the condition of the item, the appraiser said, $6,500 and $7,500. Oh my, like, oh, fantastic. Wow, that's a great surprise, thank you. The guest bought the drawing featured on the show at a yard sale in Homer, Alaska. This captivating piece, created in the 1960s, is the work of James Kivturuk Moses. Moses was a native Alaskan self-taught artist, renowned for his depictions of Alaskan landscapes and wildlife. But yet, Kivitorik Moses was known for capturing his lifestyle, the Alaska lifestyle he lived. He was a reindeer herder. The drawing illustrates a human figure pulling a reindeer with what appears to be a rope. The item was crafted using ink and watercolor on paper. Moses is celebrated for his meticulous attention to detail, capturing the intricacies of his subjects from the fur of the animals to the texture of clothing. His artworks are highly valued, and this particular drawing is remarkably well-preserved. We can expect this drawing, 
which beautifully exemplifies the Alaskan lifestyle to sell for $2,500 and $2,800. Okay, very good. At the turn of the 20th century, automobiles were transforming from luxury novelties into symbols of speed and power. During this thrilling evolution, Ernest Montalt emerged as the artist who could capture its essence. Ernest Montalt. Montalt, a French poster artist, is credited with inventing various artistic techniques that vividly depicted the excitement of early motoring. Our guest was gifted this portfolio of Montalt's work by a friend. This portfolio contains prints from early European Grand Prix car races, dating from 1895 to 1907. The book features variously beautifully rendered car designs. Remarkably, there is only one known record of this book existing, making it extremely rare. We can expect this rare portfolio of vintage car drawings to fetch a price of $8,000 to $12,000. In this episode, we are presented with unique African tribal art, showcasing four distinct tribal sculptures. These sculptures, often idols, are used by their people to connect to the divine and ask for blessings. The first sculpture originates from the Tabwa tribe, east of Lake Tanganyika. Lake Tanganyika. The second is a carving from the Bago tribe of Guinea, featuring a hornbill-like nose, a distinctive style that influenced some of Picasso's works. It's a miniature of a, a shoulder mask that they wear, which is between four and five feet tall. So when a man puts it on his shoulders, he's, he's about nine feet tall and he's covered in rats. Bega tribe of Guinea. The third sculpture, also from the Tabwa people, is made of hardwood and represents the spirit of a shaman, frequently venerated for good luck. The last piece is a sculpture from the Yoruba people in Nigeria, depicting Shango, the god of thunder and lightning. Yoruba people. Although beautifully crafted, detailed inspection reveals it is a fake. Unlike authentic pieces, its feet are not carved backwards and the axe on the head lacks the intricate detail expected in a shrine idol. What value would be placed on this fascinating collection of African tribal art? In the late 1980s, a painting was purchased for $300 at a consignment shop chosen for its appealing aesthetics. The artist, identified as Louis Aston Knight, was a French painter born in 1873. He was the son of artist Daniel Ridgway Knight, Lewis painted impressionistic French landscapes and studied under his father. This painting is an oil on canvas, clearly signed and situated in Paris. It was likely created in the first quarter of the 20th century. This painting is an excellent example of plein air painting, a term that refers to painting outdoors. The perspective features a pathway in the foreground. Lewis was recognized for his plein air painting technique, which emphasized optical fidelity. He avoided including figures in his paintings, a distinction he agreed upon with his father. The painting was praised for its quality and traditional style. While examining the condition of the item, the appraiser said, $17,000. Wow, yeah. really? It's a great painting for auction. You'd be talking in the area of seven dollars to $10,000. This painting is oddly fascinating, yet enthralling. Maybe this is because it was drawn by Dole Reed, who was more famously known for drawing landscapes rather than portraits. Nevertheless, this painting is a fine depiction of Dole's friend and showcases his expertise. Aside from the painting, however, there's another item called an aquatint. A print made by etching a copper plate with nitric acid is called an aquatint. The aquatint seen here is quite realistic, and this is what Dole was largely known for. It is likely that the combination of the painting and aquatint was done in 1935. As such, this high quality combo would retail at the auction value of looking about $4,000 to $6,000. Okay. It's a wonderful, one of a kind object. Correct. So if you were to sell this at auction, you'd probably be looking about $500 to $700. Really? Ah, yes. I can't believe it. Oh my goodness. Yeah, oh, that's great. This guest's mother purchased an intriguing painting in Nashville, Tennessee, many years ago. At the lower part of the painting, we can see the artist's signature, which belongs to David Berlich. Berlich was a Russian poet, artist, and publicist of Ukrainian origin, associated with the futurist and neo-primitivist movements. 
He also had very early on the notoriety of being a member of what was called the Blue Rider Group. And they were a very important group of German expressionist artists in Munich. The painting depicts a subject such as a farmer holding a bucket with a cow and ducks in the background. The futurist influence is particularly evident in the dynamic portrayal of movement and energy. Another interesting feature is the impasto technique, visible where the paint is thickly applied in certain areas. Interestingly, the piece was created on a board and retained its original frame. At auction, this work of art by Berlich, with its original frame and in pristine condition, would command a value of $15,000. Really? Ah, yes. I can't believe it. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Hoax 40 and 41 lithographs show oil fields where fortunes were won. A pair of lithographs by Alexandra Hoag were inherited by a guest from their mother. These lithographs depict scenes from the oil industry. This one, this guy is hooking his pump jacks to the power source. One depicts a man connecting pump jacks to a power source. The other shows businessmen making deals around the spindle top well. This well is known for a major oil blowout. Hoag part of the Dallas Nine artists in the 1930s, signed these works. They are from an edition of 50. He signed five of them, Swindletop, to reflect the shady deals depicted. Known for his love of nature, Hogue included detailed scenes of surveyors, oil derricks, and smoke. Although merely a painter, he made a few lithographs, making these rare. While examining the condition of the item, the appraiser said, Five to eight thousand dollars on that. And on the spindle top, which uh, is I would say at auction, ten to fifteen thousand dollars. A good number. Yeah. This set resembles one that was crafted for various royal families around the world. The assumption of royalty is due to the shine, which can be attributed to the golden look of the set. It's an extremely rare set with 169 pieces and was created in Germany. The set is called a Hutschenruther China set. In Bavaria by the Hutschenreuter Company. Mm -hmm. And it was shipped to the United States, plain white, as blanks. Oh. And there were many decorating companies in the United States. The expertly crafted set was manufactured in 1930. Contrary to what you might believe, this set was not created to be eaten on. Instead, it serves as a display piece, confirming wealth and status among collectors. Even though it's an exhilarating set, it's not highly sought after by most collectors. At an auction, this china set, despite its shine and luxurious appeal, would sell for. Between $2,000 and $4,000. That seems ridiculously low to me. <laughs> this collection tells the remarkable journey of Jack Marsden, a British soldier during the Second World War. Jack Marsden. Marsden, the guest's father, served in the British Army and was reported missing on May 4th, 1944, following an operation. Son, Sergeant Jack Marsden, is reported missing as the result of an operation on the night of 3-4 May 1944 stop, letter following stop. As a flight engineer, he was shot down during the bombardment of Maile Le Camp, which resulted in significant casualties. Bombardment of Maile Le Camp. Surviving the crash, Marsden was captured and later rescued by members of the French Resistance. French Resistance. The guest has brought along a map that details his journey from evasion to capture and finally escape, using color codes to illustrate each stage. Additionally, the guest has compiled photographs, artifacts from the crash sites, logbooks, and other memorabilia from Marsden's journey. This documentation not only highlights the bravery of the British soldier, but also showcases the loyalty and courage of the French resistance. They safely made it back because they were helped by the resistance yeah, I... and they just went home and got on with their lives and the French had to live under the threat of death. This collection serves as a historically significant record of one of the many incredible stories from the Second World War. What value would be placed on such an extraordinary collection? Worry the individual components are not of significant value other than the toast that people noticed. Thank you. Thank you. Not often do we see a pair of furniture with multiple shelves of such odd looks, yet satisfyingly beautiful. The guest acquired these beautiful pieces from an antique store. This identical pair of whatnots was originally inspired by the 18th century furniture makers. 
it was not until the 19th century renaissance of whatnots, making it so these pieces were developed by the prominent furniture makers, Gillows & Co, a company that was founded by Robert Gillows, a famous 18th century English furniture maker, whose works remain influential in English furniture making. Looking closely at the items, we can see intricate carvings, turned supports, and finely detailed finishings on them. Although almost perfectly matched, there are very little notable differences that can be seen on this pair of furniture. Aside from their good condition, these pieces are more valued because of the maker's name, Gillow & Co, engraved on them. At auction, these aesthetic pieces of furniture by a famous manufacturer should sell for... 22000 Don't go throwing away this stein because it's just a glass cup. This stein is an important part of sports history. Although steins are used for beers, this one was signed by the famed James Nysmith. Nysmith was the inventor of basketball. The stein was signed when Nysmith was a chapter advisor. Nysmith is also famous for writing the basketball rulebook. This stein serves as basketball memorabilia. At a suitable sports auction, this stein would fetch between six and eight hundred dollars. Thank you. Thank you, Dad. This is one of the most unique necklaces you'll ever set your eyes upon. This is largely because, unlike most necklaces made from gemstones, this one is made from nuts and bolts. This necklace represents German sheer expertise, as it was crafted by Jacob Bengel. Jacob Bengel was a chain and costume jewelry factory founded in 1873. However, this chain was crafted in 1931 and was one of the most unique pieces created. An interesting feature of this necklace is that it was created in the machine age, which was a period of great technological innovation. The necklace is made out of brass and is an enameled piece. As an early piece of innovation in jewelry, this necklace would fetch the auction price of $900 to $1,200. We'll have to learn to appreciate it more. This doll is not one of those cute ones you buy for your kids. In fact, it's a reproduction of an original doll called a French fashion doll. The original fashion dolls were made by Francois Gaultier. A signature on the back of the doll's head confirms how it would look if it was produced by Francois. Francois made the dolls between 1860 and 1916, but this doll was made in 1967. At the time of their making, French fashion dolls dominated the doll market. Although it looks oddly creepy, it's still worth a lot to many doll collectors. For quite a few years, people have thought that these dolls were dolls that were remade during World War I and were called World War I fashions. They weren't for a fact. Nevertheless, even though it's a reproduction, it would fetch the auction price of... Say $100 to $200. Guest's great-grandmother received the biscuit jar as a gift from her Sunday school students. The students, whom she affectionately called nine obstacles to getting to heaven, gave it to her upon their graduation. On her retirement, the jar was signed with a crown and C and M for Crown Milano. This indicated that it was made by the Mount Washington Glass Company, based in Massachusetts in the 1890s. The company started in Boston in the 1830s and merged with Pearpoint in 1894. The jar was silver plated and had some blemishes that needed cleaning up. Considering the jar's beauty and rarity, it was valued at $4,500. Wow. So it's a beautiful little jar, and I'm, I'm glad you brought it in. Gee, for something that's just been collecting dust, <laughs> that's not bad. The guest brought the Beatles poster she received as payment for dog and cat sitting from a lady with a large collection of Beatles memorabilia. The Beatles were an English rock band formed in Liverpool in 1960, comprising John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison and Ringo Starr. By early 1964, the Beatles were international stars and had achieved unprecedented levels of critical and commercial success. The lady's father had obtained the poster in England in 1962 or 1963 before the Beatles came to America. This poster was identified as a point of purchase poster used to sell Beatles albums in stores and dated to 1962, making it a scarce and valuable item. It was still in great condition with a wonderful image of the Beatles. The appraiser confirmed the poster to be authentic, but it had some condition issues and could easily be restored. Noting its scarcity and condition, the nostalgic poster was valued at 
between $3,000 and $5,000. Oh, wow. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, the collection of historical items includes a well-executed miniature watercolour of Napoleon III. It was painted by the guest's great-great-aunt, an enterprising miniaturist. She created two such paintings, sending one to Napoleon III, who responded with a signed letter, still preserved in its original envelope. Another notable piece in the collection is a relic from the Battle of Waterloo, discovered in 1835 by a family friend possibly a cartridge box plate or an item from a French Shaco. The inscription on this sketchbook yeah. from your great aunt's friend yes. saying that she's walking around the battlefield. This miniature painting is framed in a gesso frame featuring the Napoleonic crest. Although the connection is to Napoleon III rather than Napoleon I, the entire collection is estimated to be worth between Fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars because it's just a great little story yes. and the painting is wonderful. Yes. The guest found the items in her mother's basement after she passed away three years ago. It was suspected that her grandfather might have taken a detour through Niagara Falls, where the item was likely made by the Senecia, Iroquois, or Mohawk tribe. The first item was dated 1906 and was made as a tourist item, featuring cluster beading or clump beading. The beading gave the item dimension and made it more 3D, but it needed to be cleaned. The other item was a Cheyenne Possible bag with beading on both sides, making it rare and beautiful. The beading was done in the lazy stitch style, with each group of beads on a piece of thread tacked down at each end. The sewing was done with animal sinews and threads, and the design was classic to the 1870s and 1880s. The items were in fairly good shape, considering their age and they were appraised at. If you cleaned it up a little bit, it would probably be worth, at an auction, $150 to $200. Okay. It would probably sell for $3,000 to $5,000. Okay. Books often capture an author's essence, but this book is extraordinary. A handcrafted collection of poems and drawings by William Faulkner. A guest brought a book of poems, written and handcrafted by William Faulkner. The book was gifted by a close family friend, who revealed she had a summer fling with Faulkner in 1919. The appraiser confirmed the book's authenticity, noting Faulkner's handwriting, poetry and Art Deco style drawings. Poems by William Faulkner, and he produced the, the entire book. The, the handwriting is by him, the poems are by him, and there are also drawings in here that are absolutely beautiful. Created before Faulkner had become a published author in 1924, this piece reflects his early artistic efforts. The book is bound in beautiful vellum, adding to its uniqueness. The appraiser highlighted its rarity, mentioning that such items seldom appear at auction. If auctioned, according to the appraiser, it could fetch. $70,000 to $100,000. Really? If you're a fan of board games, then this appraisal is for you. Board games are tabletop games that typically use pieces, which are moved or placed on a pre-marked game board. The guests started collecting early editions of Monopoly games and discovered antique game boards at different shows. These games featured sophisticated graphics and colourful designs, which were meant to target adults and appeal to them as buyers. The graphics featured very intricate details being displayed on the covers, the guest recalled paying $35 to $50 for a large McLaughlin game board. He mentioned that a Man on the Moon game board sold at auction for $5,000 nine years ago. The guest's mother met Eva Hess at a summer art program in 1957, and they became close friends. They stayed in touch over the years and even picked out the guest's mother's wedding dress together. In 1960 or 1961, Eva Hess gave the guest's mother a drawing as a wedding gift. Eva Hess was a German-born artist who studied at Yale and became known for her sculptures. The drawing showed Hess's early style, which was figurative but evolved into something more mysterious. The drawing was prescient as it hinted at Hess's later work with odd shapes and materials. The letters discuss day-to-day -day life, art and Hess's health, providing valuable insight into her life and work. A testament to the enduring value of Eva Hess's legacy. The appraiser estimated the value of the archive, including letters and other items at $30,000 and $50,000. I would say for insurance, maybe around $75,000. Oh, wow. Yeah, I think we should get an insured bet. The 
guest collected World War I memorabilia and purchased a lot of items related to Camp Hancock in Augusta, Georgia. The items included documents and a diary belonging to a company clerk named Barnum. The documents were all pertained to one ordnance company with several famous baseball players. The company included seven Hall of Famers, including Ty Cobb, Honus Wagner and Christy Matheson. The players were enlisted and received training in ordnance and chemical warfare at Camp Hancock in 1918. The guest had purchased the collection for $30, unaware of its significance. He himself was surprised to find such a unique collection and recognized the significance of the documents. This mystery of a collection with many stories to uncover was appraised that two to three thousand dollars <laughs> and at auction I think it would probably go for more because it is unique and it's like a mystery. This guest and her husband discovered an oil painting dated 1953 by Kenneth Nunemaker, a self-taught artist associated with the Pennsylvania Impressionist movement. Known for his vigorous brushwork influenced by Edward Redfield, Nunemaker often painted en plein air, capturing scenes with vibrant energy. Titled Bill's Place, the painting was acquired for a mere $2, surprising the guest with its artistic quality. It bears Nunemaker's signature and is marked with the locations New Hope, Pennsylvania and Centre Bridge, where the artist lived and worked. $75? Looks to be $75. $75, so that's presumably what he was selling it for at that time. Due to the rarity of Nunemaker's works on the market, its auction value is between. Probably to fetch in the 6,000 to 10,000 range at auction. Six to 10,000? Yeah. Oh, wow. Never would I have thought that. The guest had found a purse while renovating a house, but it turned out to be a wallet pistol. The object was found in a side compartment behind the fireplace in a Cersa 1800 Cape House in Essex. The guest had hoped to find old money, but instead found the pistol. The appraiser demonstrated how the pistol worked, revealing a button that releases the barrel and a folding trigger. The pistol was based on a pinfire system that was designed by Oskar Frankenau from Nuremberg, Germany in 1877. The pistol was dated to the late 1870s and it was likely made in Germany. Concealed firearms like these were popular in the late 19th century, but this specific type was fairly scarce, a unique and valuable piece of history. This pistol was valued at three and five thousand dollars. Excellent. The guest brought a painting his aunt purchased from an artist in the early 1950s. The guest inherited the painting from her parents and had it for over 20 years. A Californian historian and illustrator, Gleason was a man of many interests, including painting, illustration, acrobatics, and music. He was known for his work with ships and boats and had a great affinity for the sea. The painting was likely a mature work, painted in the 1920s to 1940s, and is titled Sea Urchins. The guest had an insurance appraisal done in 1988 to 89, which valued the painting at $2,500. The charming painting by the talented artist was appraised at little twenty to thirty thousand dollars. Oh my! The guest's grandmother, Pauline, who studied both math and art attended Newcomb College and was taught by Ellsworth Woodward, from whom she received several treasured artworks. The Woodward brothers, Ellsworth and William, moved to New Orleans as teens, immersing in the local art scene. By 1890, Ellsworth was the first dean of the Newcomb Art School, and both brothers helped found the school and Newcomb Pottery. Pauline's collection includes a pastel sketch by William Woodward, depicting her grandmother, the collection also includes a watercolour of the Newcomb College campus, valued lower due to market preference. However, the highlight is an oil painting from 1917 showcasing the Newcomb College chapel behind a fountain. Emphasising its artistic and historical importance, at auction, this quintessential piece by Ellsworth could bring... Between $30,000 and $50,000. Ooh, that's more than I thought. Georgian era was renowned for its exquisite jewellery, often featuring intricate metalwork and vibrant gemstones. This showcase necklace is a perfect example of that exceptional craftsmanship. Our guest today comes from a family of antique jewellers in Hyde Park, Chicago, dating back to the 1930s and 1940s. This piece was passed down to her through generations, adorning the necklaces are precious gemstones, 
such as green beryl and pink stones that could either be morganite or precious topaz. The necklace also features a gold foil backing behind the pink stones. This is one of the techniques that the jewelers use to make the stone more intensely colored. Typical of Georgian era jewelry, this piece includes beautiful tiny beads surrounding the larger gemstones. Another notable feature of the necklace is its pendant, adorned with green beryl stones, pink stones, and also a gold foil backing. There are no hallmarks on this piece, so we can't be certain who made it. Nevertheless, this beautiful jewelry is estimated to be worth seven to nine thousand dollars. Really? Yes, absolutely. All oh, the family will be so pleased. My mother would just cry. <laughs> the guest inherited this vintage purse from her grandmother. It is a 14 karat gold mesh purse, dated circa 1905 to 1910. Opening the purse reveals a small powder puff and a mirror. Interestingly, the purse still contains its original powder, which is truly incredible. The hallmark of this purse is its fine, intricate weave, giving it a flexible and delicate yet sturdy appearance. Furthermore, the interior is lined with pink silk, providing a luxurious feel. Despite being made so long ago, the purse retains its allure and grace. In this condition, we can expect the purse to accrue a significant value. Say between $3,000 and $5,000. Okay, wow. These artifacts share a common origin, all hailing from India. Together, these artifacts showcase the rich history and artistry of India. First, we have a wristwatch from Kolkata with an unusual cover on the winder. This case is hallmarked in 14 karat gold, making this watch a unique piece of wristwatch jewelry valued at. Secondly, we have a small box made from ivory, beautifully designed to resemble a cottage. Upon opening it, one might expect the box to be a tea caddy, but it's actually a sewing host. Such artifacts were made in the 18th century, making this piece extremely rare and worth. Five to eight thousand pounds. Ooh, holly. Lastly, we have a brooch with a sapphire set in it, weighing about 90 carats. Named the Maharaja hat pin by the guest's father, this piece is a very unique jewellery item with an estimated value of 12 to 15,000 pounds. 